Good morning. Jesus, O Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.
Jesus, and every desire. 
Sunday school was cookies and Kool-Aid for me. That was the most exciting thing. Uh, hearing the stories of Jesus, those faithful teachers that do that, tell the stories of Jesus to our children. And we pray that they would be raised up in the way in which they should go, so that when they are old, they may not depart from that way. That's what I'm claiming for my kids. They were raised to trust Jesus. They were raised to love Jesus. Whether I'm seeing that evident today or not. That's the way they were brought up. And uh, I'm really in safe territory. None of them watched the video. So, <laughs> you know. They would get, if, if, if they did, they would be calling me every Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Dad, you did it again. So this last, uh, a few weeks ago, I had the privilege of going to lunch with uh, a beautiful group of women. Uh, they meet on Wednesdays. They're women of the word. And we had a great time. Uh, we went to the Olive Garden and... Uh, that poor girl earned her tip. <laughs> I guarantee you. Uh, but as we were sitting there, Miss Della told a story that uh, I have been thinking about and musing on. And I wanted to share it with you as we kind of start our time together. She was telling us of two older men that had already been uh, put in a senior adult living center and they'd already had some severe health complications and and uh, they, they both became fast friends and they loved to watch baseball together. They just loved to watch the game. They loved it. And uh, they got to talking and say, you know, we're not probably going to get any better and uh, let's make a covenant. And the covenant is this. Uh, whoever dies first, when they get to heaven, they're going to check to see whether or not there is baseball in heaven. And so they said, sounds good, let's do that. So they, uh, uh, a few days went by, and sure enough, one of the gentlemen passed on to glory, and good to his word, he came back that night to his friend, and told him and said, uh, all right, you know, I came back, like we said, he goes, oh man, I'm dying to know, is there baseball in heaven? So the gentleman that had passed, he said, well, I have good news and I have bad news. Which would you like first? And the guy said, give me the good news. He said, well, the good news is that there is baseball in heaven. Well, what's the bad news? Well, you're starting to pitch in Sunday's game. <laughs> now, when Miss Della told it, she did a much better job. And we just roared. We just died laughing. Uh, in fact, the name, she didn't know this, but the people sitting across the aisle from us or across the uh, 
the path there from us in the, in the booth were dying laughing too. <laughs> they heard her joke. It was just great. But if you ever want a delightful time, uh, take those ladies to lunch some Wednesday at 12 o'clock, and you will be delighted to spend time with them. So, Miss Della, thanks for telling that story. Um, we've been camped out in Acts chapter 4. And we're going to be there again today, and it appears, I don't know, we may be there again next week. I was going to end this today, but I got to looking at the rest of the chapter. And I thought, oh my, that's just too good to not talk about. It's just too good. But I was on the way here, and... Um, you know, as I prepare my heart in the mornings to uh, stand, uh, one of the things that is really an overwhelming thing uh, is just how dependent I am upon the Lord to help me. Um, and I was thinking how bad I need the Lord. And he said, well, yes, you do. <laughs> but this song came to my heart. And, uh, but Randy, am I up too loud? I need thee every hour. Most great. Tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 
Well, I didn't have room in your bulletin to put verses 21, uh, uh, and so I, I wanted to put, I wanted to, uh, or do, do that, did I start in 21? I started in 24, yeah, that's what I thought. So I'm going to go back and read, um, pick up for us verses 21 through 23, and then you'll see there in your bulletin, 24 on. In honor of the reading of God's word, would you stand together and hear the word of the Lord? And you remember the background. Peter and John have been uh, to the temple. They have passed a lame man who's over 40 years old, lame all of his days. And they make that wonderful, fabulous statement, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Rise up and walk. And the man was healed miraculously. And so because of that, they're brought before the Sanhedrin. They're brought before the 70 plus uh, scholars and elders and Pharisees and Sadducees and towns, uh, the town leaders. And they're questioned and they are uh, being persecuted for this faith and what their message is. And so in verse 21, the word says, So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So, then they, so when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, or truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threat and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Be seated, please. Praise is powerful. Praise is not only a powerful weapon, but in this case, this was a powerful deterrent. They were going to be persecuted, and they had been threatened uh, severely by the Sanhedrin. But because of the praise of the people of God, they didn't do anything. Praise is a great deterrent. It's also a powerful weapon. You remember in 2 Chronicles 20, when Israel and uh, King Jehoshaphat, uh, I, sidebar, <laughs> what do they mean by jumping Jehoshaphat? <laughs> I don't know. You ever heard that experience? I, I, think, I think it's because of that story. Because they were praising, they were surrounded by all the arms of the enemy, and Jehoshaphat prayed. And I love his last line in his prayer. He said, now this is the king, okay? He says, Lord, I don't know what to do. See, some of us always have a better idea. 
Oh, we always know what to do in every situation. Just let me walk in on the scene. And I'll fix it. Daddy, fix it. Mama, fix it. Brother, fix it. Papa, fix it. You see, but here's the king confessing before the Lord, I don't know what to do, Lord. I need thee every hour. Right. So they began to praise. Some, some wonderful person in the group there had a word from God. And he said, let's praise the Lord. And they began to praise the Lord the next day. They sent the praisers out there instead of the army. They sent the praisers out there. And the Lord took their praise and routed the enemy and destroyed them utterly, the scripture said. Oh, praise is powerful. Praise is given in this case. And it was a deterrent. It was also a powerful weapon. Now they offered up a prayer, uh, and this prayer is, a, is an amazing thing, and I want you to see this. Uh, it, I, I'd like to look at it in three, uh, three ways. First of all, the prayer acknowledges the person of God and God's possession. They acknowledge the person of God and God's possessions. Look what they say. They're, they're praying in one accord, and that does not mean that they drove a Honda. <laughs> I've heard some of y'all read that and think, oh my, but the disciples drove a Honda. They were all together in one accord. That's not good exegesis, is it, Catherine? <laughs> they said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. God is the boss. God is in control no matter what is going on around us, no matter the circumstance in your life, no matter what you're facing, no matter what the enemy is doing, no matter the fact they're surrounding us and we don't know what to do, God is the boss. God is in control. And they acknowledge that right off the bat. They give basically a Christian worldview. A Christian worldview, they acknowledge the fact that God is the one who has created. But then they go on in their prayer and they say, Who by the mouth of your servant David had said it? They acknowledge in their Christian worldview. He <laughs> said, Well, wait, look, you know, okay, but we'll talk about that today. They acknowledge in their worldview. That not only has God created, but God has spoken. This is why our faith must be grounded in the Word of God. Because this is the primary way in which God has spoken to His people. It's through His Word. And that's what they're saying. Who by the mouth of your servant David has said. And we have that psalm, Psalm 2, to... Uh, to say that this is where this, this uh, excerpt is lifted from. And they, they he, he, uh, Peter's preaching, or they're, or they're praying. I don't know who's praying. It could have been somebody else in Peter. But they say, why do the nations rage? And the people plot vain things. The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Old Testament Psalm 2. They were already anti-Christ. They were already anti-Christian. They were, these nations as they gathered, they were angry. Why did the nations rage? 
I was thinking about the fact that one of the defenses in a, in a plea that can be made in a court of law, if someone killed someone, they talk about it being a crime of passion because they were so filled with rage in the moment that they end up doing something horrible. Well, it was a crime of passion. Listen, the nations of the world that are anti-Christ, anti-Christian, are an angry bunch of people. They are floated and buoyed by their emotion. And it behooves the church of the living God to have a clear, rational answer. Rational in the midst of irrational. A peaceful, clear message in the midst of an out-of-control rage and emotion. And in many cases, friends, it does absolutely no good to engage in a conversation with someone who is that angry. You're wasting your breath and you're wasting your time. They're angry. They were organized. They were a people who plot these things out. Listen, the enemy is organized. You know how we organize ourselves in our church? And for those of you that have read the, the, uh, the pathway, the, the discipleship pathway, we come in the door through worship. We try and connect with each other in the places where we live. We want to make sure that needs are addressed and uh, there are uh, ministries that can restore. The, and then we, we want to make sure that everyone is equipped to be a disciple and to make a disciple. And then we want to be used of God to be a blessing to our community. We're structured. We have a pathway. So does the enemy. They are organized. And just as organized as any church is the wickedness in the world. They say, you take this territory. We'll take that territory. We'll deal in this. Y'all deal in this. We'll pool our resource together. And we'll take over that community for Satan. Heard the testimony of a Satanist. I don't want to chase this rabbit for very long. Uh, but he'd gotten saved, radically saved. And he confirmed what I'm telling you. He said, man, we were organized and connected in the perpetration of sin. And so uh, the enemy is angry. The enemy is organized. The enemy is defiant. The kings of the earth took their stand. Just defiant. Finally, uh, the enemy is unified. The rulers were gathered together. You can do a lot when you're one with each other. Um, if you remember back in the Old Testament, one of the reasons in Genesis 11 why God had to confuse the languages because all of the people had come together in oneness. And they said, we're going to build a tower to the heavenlies. And we're going to rule ourselves. And the Lord himself said, see the people, that they are one. And there is nothing that could be not done by this group of unified heathens. And so he confused their languages. It's one reason why we have... Uh, you know, all the list of nations a little later on, or, or I think it was chapter 10, the list of nations. Um, but the languages were confused. Unity is a powerful thing. And when the church of the living God figures out that we are better together, unified under God, built on the word of God, we can 
effectuate a whole lot more ministry than if we're just on our own. Well, that was uh, that was the perspectives in in opposition. God is not only acknowledged as creator, he's acknowledged the fact that he has spoken, but also that the prayer goes on, that he is the God who has acted, the God who has acted in redemption. It says uh, that your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. I get asked all the time because one of the very uh, kind of in mode, in fashion now, uh, in theological circles, we've moved uh, where uh, Calvinism and predestination are popular again among many, among many of the young pastors, they have moved uh, to a place where they are five-point Calvinist, where they are uh, preaching and teaching predestination. Now, before you get too upset, <laughs> uh, they are Christians. They're Christians. Just because someone has a variant understanding of the Word of God on some major type issues like that doesn't negate the fact that they possibly can know the Lord. <laughs> and I, I happen to think, this is just a, a, another sidebar, I happen to think that that is the reason that we have denominations is so that people can find a place where they understand the Word of God in such a way that what is being taught and what is being preached and what is being lived conforms to their understanding of the Word of God. But I, I have served in those churches. I have served in a Calvinistic setting. And uh, I'll never forget you know, I'm just the worship guy. I'm just leading the music. I left all that theological stuff to the theologian. And I would always get, you know, buttonholes saying, you know, come, come here, Mario. You're not, now, you are a five-point capitalist, aren't you? And I go, huh? I'm just a music guy. Y'all worry about all that. But I want you to know something. The Bible right here in verse 28 whether you and I like it or not, preaches and teaches predestination. It says, they're praying and they say, Lord, that the, the coming together of uh, Jesus and his life and his ministry and then uh, Herod and Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, Israel, all of these people gathered together against your Christ is according to your purpose determined before to be done. God predestined this moment in history. I have heard a great preacher say one time, he said, because he, he had been approached, do you believe in predestination? And he said, yes. And he said, well, can you explain it? He said, no. <laughs> he said I have to believe in predestination because the word of God teaches it but I don't understand it and he gave a great example he said uh, I, uh, I believe in electricity but I don't know how it works I just know that when you flip the button on the lights come on I don't know about all that circuitry. You'd have to talk to Ken Hayes. He could explain all that circuitry and wiring and gizmos and negative and 
and uh, AC current, DC current. You have to get with somebody that's an electrical uh, guru to tell you how electricity works. All I know is that there is such a thing as electricity and it works, but I don't have to understand it. And there's some things about the word of God that when we stand in the presence of the omnipotent God who has ways that are higher than our ways, we have to stand there and we have to say, along with King Jehoshaphat, Lord, I, I don't know. I don't know, but you know. Yeah. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Well, let's move on. Right. Praise is powerful. The prayer was to the person of the Lord and all his possessions. We saw these perspectives, these two worldviews, one being a Christian worldview, one being uh, an anti-Christ worldview. And the plan is this plan of redemption that God had planned beforehand. Now let's look finally at this petition. They, uh, they begin to, to uh, kind of wrap up their prayer in verse 29. And they're saying, now Lord, Look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. The petition that they were asking the Lord to grant was for boldness to speak the word of God. Boy, there's a lot of words going out. But are we speaking the word of God? This word boldness is a great word. It's a great word. It means freedom to speak. It means plain speaking. And it means confident speaking. Oh, that the church of the living God could be equipped to give a confident, free, and plain, cogent message of the word of God. One of the reasons why we have the disciple makers, and let me just uh, encourage any of you that thought you might want to do that, you thought you missed out, you have one, I was informed by our director of discipleship this morning, you got one more chance to get involved now, but otherwise you'll have to wait till next year. So if you're interested in that, see Pastor Regina, and she'd love to talk to you about that. But I want us to look at this prayer that they're, this petition that they're asking the Lord to grant. They're asking, number one, for boldness to speak. And number two, they're asking that the Lord do the healing and the signs and wonders. The Lord do it. You see what it says? By stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of of your holy servant Jesus. I think that's a great way to understand uh, our responsibility and God's responsibility. Our responsibility is to speak his word, to speak the name of Jesus into every situation. And it is God's responsibility to grant as he chooses. And as he delivers, it's his decision. I, I don't understand um, the fact that, man, I, I can believe for people. We, we uh, had a very, uh, I mean, it was been a hard week because many of you know the ministry of Bill Johnson. And many of you know uh, what a great work has been done at, at Bethel. But this last week, Bill's precious wife passed away. I can't think of a group of people on the planet that probably all together have more faith to believe God for great things. And yet, God did not grant healing from the cancer that she suffered from and succumbed to. 
Friends, listen, it's that place once again where we stand before an almighty God and we just say, Lord, unless you do it, unless you deliver us from these enemies, unless you heal, unless by the power of Jesus' name, uh, you get glory to do signs and wonders and healings. Lord, you do it. We're going to task ourselves with preaching your word and being faithful to preach the word and speak in the name of Jesus. It's God's business. That was their petition. And look, finally, there was power. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. It says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Ooh. Now the context of this is this. What was the word of God that they spoke? The context, if you go back to the beginning of the chapter, is they preached the resurrection. That was the task. That was the job. Preach the resurrection. Preach in the name of Jesus. And then the signs and wonders were followed. Listen, we're to preach like Peter and John. We're to be equipped like Peter and John were, to give a defense of our faith. Where we're going next uh, in our sermon series, we're going to be looking at apologetics. Apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia. We get a, an English derivative, apology. But it's not the same word. An apology is, well, I'm, De Debbie, I'm sorry I made you cry at work. Because she, Debbie, cries every day at work. She does. She cries with laughter. She's a happy person. And uh, that's an apology. But an apologia is a defense of the faith. You remember what Peter said. In 1 Peter 3.15, he said, Be ready to give a defense for the faith that you have. Ready to speak a word. So we're going to talk about that, and uh, it's going to be my goal and my hope to equip all of us to give a clear, cogent word of God, faith, God perspective, to people in any situation. <laughs> So we're going we're gonna to look at that in the days ahead. But they were empowered when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, that's my prayer every week when we gather. Oh, Lord, fill us all with your Holy Spirit. Lord, use us. Lord, may we come needy as we are. And just come before you and say that we need you every hour. Sing that chorus one more time as we open up this altar. I need thee, oh, I need thee. this altar this morning. May we come poor and needy as we are in need of you. Some of us would say with Jehoshaphat, Lord, I don't know what to do. And unless you deliver me, you're going to what? We're going to get wiped out. But I'm going to praise you in a minute. And I'm going to send praise out like a powerful weapon to rout the enemy. It's coming in around me, seeking to destroy me with all the threats and the, the rage and the anger, the defiance. Lord, it just seems like everything conspires against me. But I'm standing today, standing today upon the word of God. I'm standing today confidently asking that you uh, fill me me with your Holy Spirit to be bold. 
God, I pray that you would take whatever decisions are made at this altar today, that you would take them and seal them in the courts of heaven. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we come to this time. If you have a need, you just come to the altar and pray. I don't know what God is speaking to you today. Just come. It might be just that simple request of just saying, I need you. Whatever that is, you come. We won't tarry long. If we uh, find ourselves getting to where we need to do more and say more, uh, altar ministers, feel free to use the, the Anna's room and the prayer room, okay? So don't be don't be shy to move in that direction if you need to. Come before the Lord.
like just the armies of the enemy that would come us to battle. And basically, when Jehoshaphat prayed that prayer in Chronicles, he basically was saying, Lord, we don't have a chance. We don't stand a chance unless you do something. Maybe you're at that place. You need somebody to agree with you, to pray with you. Say, no, you do have the victory in Jesus Christ. In the power of the name of Jesus. The altar's open, you come. The Holy Spirit leads you.
guests today, please uh, be extra patient with us in the last few minutes of our time together. Uh, we are, as we are all together in one accord, uh, in one place, at one time, we are trying to walk through very deliberately and pedantically, you know, decidedly, one thing at a time to understand why it is that the United Methodist Church is has already split, and why we as a church uh, have uh, overwhelmingly said we can no longer stay United Methodist. Um, now some of you, that may pose a question. And so for the next several weeks, in your inserts, you're gonna get just a little uh, blank piece of paper that says, I have the following questions, and there's slots there for three, but you can uh, you can attach a 20-page document if you wish. I hope you don't, because uh, Lori and Foot is going to have to read it, uh, and uh, not that she would mind. But if you have a question, you know, some of you may say, "Well, I don't even know that I understand the word disaffiliation." Well. It means right now we are affiliated with, we're connected with the United Methodist Church, have been for over 40 years. But we are looking to disaffiliate and break that connection, sever that connection. And so we have to undergo a very thorough process. And so let me, before we get the, as Deborah has got the video ready to go, I'm sure, let me just say this, what we're gonna be doing, uh, we have 
three, three more videos or four more videos. Uh, this is number three today. And then uh, we're going to have three weeks of taking the same amount of time at the end of the service, 10, 15 minutes at the end of the service, for Lorian uh, and myself and Pastor Regina to take your questions and to give us three weeks. Uh, you're going to be receiving a document uh, in a few short weeks that talks about some uh, of the belief statements and uh, doctrinal things that we need to consider in anticipation of a vote sometime this fall when we as a congregation on a Sunday morning all together will vote and we will raise our hand and say, you know, we're no longer wanting to be United Methodist. Uh, there'll be a couple of more votes along with that, but uh, I'm doing the best I can to equip you. I don't want anybody to come to the vote, the Sunday of the vote, and go, what? Huh? We're doing what? What are you talking about? Now, if you're first Sunday here, then I can get it. But if you've been coming for the last few weeks, then hopefully we'll give you the tools. Devin, don't do that to me. Uh, Hopefully, we're giving you the equipment to uh, to understand that. So let's watch this next video. This is video number three, and why it has become difficult to remain uh, with the United Methodist Church. Friends, I hope you've benefited from the first two videos in this series describing the differences that are dividing the United Methodist Church. In the last video, I spoke with you about how differently United Methodists think about the Bible. For some of us, the scriptures are, as Paul described them, God-breathed, inspired, and authoritative, given to us by God himself, so we can know his heart, his mind, and his will. That will be the view of scripture held by the Global Methodist Church. The scriptures will be our authority in determining what is spiritually true and morally pleasing to God. For other United Methodists, the scriptures are the best that men and women knew at the time. Some parts they got right, other parts they got wrong. It's up to us to determine which are which. But we now know more than the ancients did. We are free to decide where they were mistaken. This view has sometimes been pretty just chronological snobbery. It says that because we live in a later time, we have better insights. We're assigned to reason, or the insights of our postmodern culture contradict what the Bible told us, then we can be sure that we are right, and those who lived in more primitive cultures are wrong. So the scriptures are not fully inspired, nor are they truly authoritative, nor should they be trusted as normative for the Christian life. If you did not watch the previous video, please go back and do so. I provide quotes from United Methodist pastors and officials who support this very different view. Differences about the Bible are extremely important, but today's topic, even more so. Because in this video, we will be looking at how differently United Methodist bishops and pastors and seminary professors view Jesus from traditional Christian teaching that Jesus is divine, the Savior of the world, the Lord of all, the way, the truth. Again, if you're unfamiliar with the deep divisions within the UMC, what I'm about to tell you will be not only shocking, but maybe unbelievable. That's why I will be quoting what others have said. So that these videos do not appear to be personal attacks. In most cases, I will not be using names, but I assure you every example I give you is true. And if you must have names, please contact me through Good News, and I will provide you with the names. So the question is, are we United Methodists truly divided over the person and work of Jesus? If we are, that means we don't just have different opinions about matters that are of little importance, because Christianity is Christ. The early Christians did not die because Rome disagreed with the teaching of Jesus. No one was persecuted in the first centuries AD because they preached the ethic of Jesus that we should love our neighbor. No one was put to death because they taught that greed and hypocrisy were wrong. They were executed for claiming that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Lord over their lives, Lord over Rome, Lord over all. They proclaimed that Jesus was God incarnate and that it was his life, death, and resurrection that made us right with God. 
So if we discover that we have significantly different views on the person and work of Jesus, what theologians refer to as Christology, then it means that we are two different tribes, maybe even two different faiths that have been pretending to be one church. Now what makes me think that there are different and contradictory Christologies within the UMC? Well, first, we have a United Methodist bishop who wrote that Jesus had bigotries and prejudices that he had to give up. This comes in a piece where she writes about Jesus' encounter with the Canaanite woman in Matthew 15. In it, she states that Jesus had to come around to see this woman as a genuine person and to treat her as she deserved because he first judged her according to her gender and ethnicity. Then she states, quote, like you and me, he didn't have his life figured out. He was still growing, maturing, putting the pieces together about who he was and what he was supposed to do. Listen to this. She said, we might think of him as the rock of ages, but he was more like a hunk of clay, forming and reforming himself in relation to God. And then she warns us, too many folks want to make an idol out of him. So Jesus was prejudiced and bigoted. In the middle of his ministry, he was still a hunk of clay, having to come around and figure out who he was and what was right, and we should not make an idol out of Jesus. What is an idol? It's a false god. It's something or someone that we look to, trust in, or serve in hopes of receiving blessing in life. Something or someone that we look to, trust in, and serve that is not God. Your idol might be money, it might be power, it might be a job, a political agenda, or a spouse, or your idol, according to this bishop, might be Jesus. Any of those things you might be tempted to put in the place of the one true God. But how can Jesus be an idol, a false God, if he's truly God? If John is right that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt if we are historic Orthodox Christians who confess in the words of the Nicene Creed that Jesus was, quote, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, one in being with the Father, through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. If the historic Christian faith is true, how can Jesus be an idol? What does the second article of religion of the United Methodist Church state about Jesus? Quote, he is the Son, who is the Word of the Father, the very and eternal God of one substance with the Father. If the Bible is true, if the Nicene Creed is correct, if our articles of religion are accurate, Jesus could never be an idol. We might worry about not loving him sufficiently, or worshiping him properly, or following him closely enough. But making him into an idol, that is the last thing that any Christian needs to worry about unless you are a current United Methodist bishop. Here's something you should worry about. This bishop was never corrected by any of the other bishops, never held accountable for teaching false doctrines and promoting the deficient Christology. A past United Methodist seminary president stated that those who feel a need to evangelize persons of other faiths have an incorrect perception of what it means to follow Jesus. Wait a minute. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He told his followers to go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to obey all that he had taught. And yet, a United Methodist Seminary president teaches that people who already have a religion don't need to be told about Jesus. I mean, I guess, why would they? They already have faith. Why do they need Jesus? Maybe because Acts 4 tells us there's no other name given under heaven or earth by which we may be saved. In the ancient world, everyone had a God, everyone had a religion, but it was into that world that Jesus sent his disciples to evangelize with his name. This is not some woke young pastor that slipped past a conference board of ministry in a liberal annual conference. This was a president of one of our United Methodist seminaries. And guess what? No bishop ever corrected him or held him accountable. In the South Central jurisdiction, candidates for bishop respond in writing to numerous questions. They also have an hour of dialogue with our delegation. One candidate who came before us was a pastor and a professor. He was asked about the importance of witnessing. He responded that some of his students did not feel comfortable telling others about Jesus. He stated they feel to do so is, quote, religious and cultural imperialism. 
He continued, but I tell them that they can tell others about their faith simply because a man says to his wife, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. It does not mean that other wives are not sunshine for their husbands. I looked around the room and some of our delegation were nodding their heads. I raised my hand and asked, are you saying that in the same way Jesus brings light and truth into our lives, other religious leaders do the very same thing for their followers? Yes, he answered. So I pressed him. So when I say that Jesus is the Savior of the world, really all I'm saying is that he is the Savior of my world. Again, his answer was affirmative. And then he said, I tell my students, God is wholesale, Jesus is retail. Let me translate that for you. God is Tommy Hilfiger. And you can get Tommy God in Jesus J.C. Penney's or Buddha's Bloomingdale's or Muhammad's Macy's. It doesn't matter where you get Tommy Hilfiger. It's the same product. And in his mind, it doesn't matter where you get God. Any retail outlet in the cosmic mall of universal truths will do. It's still God. It's still the same God. And Jesus is no better at connecting you rightly to that God than any other respected religious figure. He's just retail. Now the good news is this candidate was not elected to become bishop. The bad news is that he returned to his United Methodist Seminary, a different seminary than the one I just mentioned where the president said we don't need to tell people about Jesus. He's there teaching men and women how to preach the gospel and pastor churches, possibly your church one day, if you remain in the UMC. When I served on the National Board of Church and Society, I heard the general secretary, you paid his salary, say, I don't know if Jesus believed he was the Messiah. What? I came to seek and save the lost, Jesus said. I give my life as a ransom for many, Jesus said. No one comes to the Father but by me. And you question whether Jesus believed he was the Messiah. A bishop, a seminary president, a seminary professor, a general secretary. And there are many others just like them. And there are many pastors. This past Good Friday, United Methodist pastor in New England wrote on the United Methodist clergy Facebook page that he did not believe that God sent Jesus into the world to die for our sins. He wrote, such a doctrine is odious and repulsive. And other United Methodist pastors piled on and praised him for being bold. Thank you for speaking the truth. Thank you for saying what needs to be said. And all of this in spite of the fact that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Savior, Jesus, not from our sins, not from judgment, not according to this pastor and other United Methodist pastors who have called him. I met a pastor just a few weeks ago in Alabama. He told me that he was Southern Baptist. He was going to seminary a Southern Baptist seminary, but he met and fell in love with John Wesley. He began to think that maybe he should be a United Methodist pastor, so he began to attend the large downtown United Methodist Church nearby. That's where one of the pastors told him that she did not believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Now that did not surprise me because years before, a woman in the church that I served told me that she had been praying for her daughter and her son-in-law to come to real faith in Jesus. And she was so happy when they began to attend the church. It happened to be that very same church where the associate pastor said she did not believe that Jesus had been resurrected. And when she talked with her daughter and her son-in-law, they were in a Sunday school class where they were taught the same thing. The miracles did not happen. Christ had not been resurrected. He certainly did not die for our sins. She called up the senior pastor of that large church. And when she told him what was being taught in that Sunday school class, he said, well, if they don't like that one, they can go to another. We have all kinds of views that are taught here. A young pastor in my annual conference was hoping to be ordained in the California Pacific Annual Conference. That's the southern part of California. But in the course of a conversation with his BS, he was asked about his understanding of Jesus. And, and the young man talked about his calling to lead others to saving faith in Christ. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. His district superintendent told him directly that his understanding of faith in Jesus was far too exclusionary. The district superintendent said in Southern California, United Methodists value inclusion in 
that Jesus is just one of the ways to God, but not the only way, and that this young man would never be ordained in that annual conference. I could share so many more stories with you, but these are enough for you to hear that we United Methodists are deeply and irreconcilably divided on Jesus. Our United Methodist seminaries cannot be trusted to teach basic truths about Christ. Our bishops cannot be counted on to correct false teaching, either because they are unconcerned or because they share these wrong views. The question, the most important question is, who is Jesus? Is he just one of many, one of many guides, one of many lights, one of many teachers, one of many saviors, one of many sources to be considered as we determine the truth about God, the nature of reality, and morality? Please hear this. When you talk about Jesus, you are talking about the one who suffered 39 lashes, his back torn apart with a cat of nine tails, studded with bone and glass and metal, and then nailed to a cross to die the most painful and shameful death the Roman Empire could divide. And he did so, so our sins could be forgiven, so our hearts could be changed, so the curtain could be torn in two, and I could walk into the presence of God, cleansed by his blood, and holy in the Father's sight. When you talk about Jesus, you were talking about my Lord and my love and my life. And there's no treasure you can set before me. There's no threat you can bring against me. There's no prize you can offer me that can cause me to deny a single word the scriptures teach about who he is or what he has done for me. For all who need to Life. He is the one who reconciles a sinful world and my sinful soul to God. Jesus is not one of many. He is the one and only. Again, it may be hard for you to believe what I've told you, but the church has struggled with this problem since its beginning. In the book of Jude, we read about false teachers today. In verse 3 it says, They denied Jesus Christ, our only Lord and Sovereign. They were in the church. They were looked up to as teachers, and they denied the true lordship of Jesus. They made him into one of many, rather than proclaiming him as the one and only. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but once we traditionalists leave, the United Methodist Church will never again elect as bishop a man or a woman who possesses a traditional understanding of the Christian faith. And what you may have a hard time believing now will become commonplace in the post-separation view. We have two very different understandings of the Christian faith. We have much bigger issues than sexuality. We disagree about Jesus. And you must decide if you feel comfortable being in a church and raising your children in a church that allows its pastors and its bishops to teach that Jesus is just one of many. If not, the Global Methodist Church is for you. Please join me in our next video as I talk about the differences that exist within the UMC regarding sexuality. God bless you. Pastor So that's our plan for the next few weeks to just kind of educate ourselves and move this along. And uh, that way we can vote. Uh, with a good conscience, a good clear conscience, and know exactly what it is we're understanding. Amen? Say again. Oh, I forgot one of the most, two of the most amazing things. I am sorry, but uh, we uh, have a young man that's coming to join. Lanny, come on up. Uh, I had intended on calling Lanny up. Lanny Martindale, he, uh, he's a dear brother, and I've had the opportunity to spend some time with him and visit with him, and uh, he is he's a wonderful guy. You need to get to know him. Uh, he loves the Lord, and he knows the Lord, and he knows the Word, and he knows a lot about a lot of stuff. So he, he's a, he would be a very good conversationalist uh, for you. But Lanny, uh, just a couple of things. Um, are you expressing today that you have faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior? I am. And will you, uh, in coming to this church, will you support us with your prayers, with your presence, with your gifts, your service, and your witness, if you will say I will? I will. All right. Thank you. Church.
Amen. And then we also have one of the most amazing men that I know. I've known him since I was a boy. And since he was a boy. But his birthday is going to be on Tuesday. Lamar, stand up. Stand up, Lamar. Stand up. about praying so please do that if you are a visitor here we have some bags for you uh we have some bags for the kiddos male and female anywhere from like three to ten and then we have some adult bags so if you're a visitor please make sure you get a bag eight members do what you do best if they don't want to get up bring them a bag to them okay i think that's about it did i leave out anything Okay, well he's 17, but we'll continue to him. Okay. just so that you know. Okay, I think that's about it. If I hadn't left out anything, if you would please, let's stand for the benediction. Now, after I do the benediction, if you still need prayer, just come on up and the prayer team will meet with you uh, for more prayer. And also prayer team, I need you soon also too in David's room. So anyway, let us all bow. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your presence here today. God, Lord, we stand on your word. We stand, Lord, with you. We stand with Jesus. 
We stand with the Holy Spirit, Father God, we thank you. And Lord, we will continue to lift our eyes up to you. For you, Lord, are where our help comes from. So Father, blessings upon these people, Father. Blessings, Father. I pray peace in their lives. I pray breakthrough. I pray change, Father. I come against all oppression, come against all depression, anything and everything, Lord, that's coming against your word, the lives of these people. In the name of Jesus, Father, I break it. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Even in these times, Lord, the best is yet to come. You have something for each and every one of us. For each and every one of us. So, Lord, give us the courage, Father, to stay with you. Blessing upon these your people, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.